Um, let's talk first. I, I don't know how familiar everybody is with some of the issues that are being discussed under the rubric of digital trade. Um, but a lot of these have proven very controversial and very difficult. And uh, we had a session earlier uh, in this uh, meeting on Monday that Marilia participated in on data localization and barriers to cross-border data flow. That's certainly been one big issue, but there are other issues as well on the agenda. So I thought perhaps, Marilia, you could give a little overview from the work you've been doing uh, uh, about some of the issues that parties have introduced. Right. Thank you very much, Bill. Indeed, data localization is one of the issues that are is the most mentioned when we are talking about the inclusion of digital policy issues in trade discussions or negotiations. But there are many more, as you have mentioned um, before, in trade agreements. We see the inclusion of intermediary liability in the TPP, um, which is still relevant, even though the U.S. has backed down from the TPP. Provision of the, of the TPP are still being seen as a model that could influence, for instance, the process of renegotiation of NAFTA, so it's a model that is still relevant to us. Cryptography, source code, spam, they have all been included before in the TPP and also on the trade on, on services, uh, which has one of, as one of the negotiating parties, the European Union. But I wouldn't want to focus on trade agreements here for two reasons. One of them is because I think that in the internet governance spaces, because these processes have been uh, so um, lacking transparency, this has been the focus of discussions that we have had before in the IGF, in the Eurodig. And there is another pressing issue that probably requires uh, a more urgent discussion from our side too, which is the upcoming negotiations of the WTO uh, Ministerial on e-commerce. The WTO Ministry will happen in the end of the year, in November, in Buenos Aires. Um, the WTO has a working program on electronic commerce that dates back from 98. Um, some progress has been made, but not that much progress, and progress has been uneven uh, in different commissions in the WTO. Services has progressed more than goods, more than intellectual property, for example. But there is an increasing pressure to make progress with e-commerce in the WTO. Partly, because negotiations in the WTO has been, have been stalled in different areas. Um, there is a pressure to show positive results. And also because e-commerce has provided some very good examples um, of promoting development in several developing countries, including uh, China, Brazil, Argentina. They all have champions in e-commerce e that have created some dynamism in the local national economy. So this is a topic that the WTO wants to discuss uh, very much. And the way that this is taking place is that member countries have put forward some non-papers. They call non-papers because they are non-binding. Um, these are exploratory papers in which countries have put forward their opinions on issues and topics that could be included in future trade negotiations, but it's not certain that they will be. Um, and which are the, these issues? One of them that is very important for member countries in the WTO is taxation. Since the work program on, the, on electronic commerce has been introduced, and there has been a moratorium on taxation on electronic transmissions. And this means that electronic transmissions, when they cross their border, they, are not, uh, uh, they do not go uh, under taxation over customs duties. Um, but the problem there is right now is that there is a discussion, should we extend uh, this moratorium, which has been renewed every two years, into something more permanent or not? Uh, the US, the European Union, Japan, they are very much in favor of extending and making this moratorium permanent, whereas other countries are questioning if this is, would be a good thing or not especially uh, because of the fact that there are many uh, products that were crossing the border before, such as music, such as books, that do not necessarily cross the border uh, anymore because they cross as electronic transmissions. Are these still goods? Are these services? There is some uh, lack of clarity, uh, whereas with regards to how to classify these digitized products, and that creates uh, problems. Other issues that have been raised by some member countries is in the context of 3D printing and all the changes that 3D printing will bring, especially the association of 3D scanning and 3D printing, and how this will impact the flow of goods cross borders. So there is still uncertainty and lack of knowledge of how this is going to play out. 
So some countries prefer to extend the moratorium for a couple of years more and review the situation later. But not only taxation uh, is being discussed in the WTO, another very important point is uh, mark, uh, data flows and, and barriers to data flows that can uh, create a lot of problems that data flows underpin uh, e-commerce, especially the commerce of services after all. And in this point, there is a clear position from uh, the European Union, like we have heard from, from the Commission, um, from the US, from Japan, to try to make uh, measures such as data localization something that's, that, that is seen as not accepted uh, worldwide. Whereas there are countries that believe that data localization is not a good thing, but there are still rules in place that would prevent data localization. This has been, for instance, the position of the government of Brazil in the known paper that they have uh, put forward. Another topic um, that is very uh, hot in the WTO is trade uh, facilitation. And this is probably a good discussion to take place in the WTO. Not all the inclusions of topics in the trade agenda are necessarily bad. This is something that needs to take place. So for instance, uh, paperless trade, this is something that needs uh, to be more harmonized across countries. And what they call as single window, which is the opportunity that a country has to go to one single focal point in other country administration to fill all the paperwork or to do all the administrative procedures. Nowadays, uh, many times, if you are an e-commerce company, you need to go to different authorities in the countries that you want to sell to, uh, and a single window would make this process uh, much more uh, simple. Um, there is some topics, uh, there are some topics that are discussed that are very uh, relevant to internet governance communities as well. These topics, they have not been put forward by a large number of countries, but by a few of them. One of them is network neutrality. Brazil has tabled uh, in their known paper that network neutrality should be framed uh, as a trade issue and the adoption of a network neutrality principle would encourage competition and trade and facilitate trade. Technical standards is a topic that has been included uh, by uh, the US in the European uh, Union, especially the need to foster interoperability as a way to encourage and strengthen competition. And the transference of technology is another important point, and here we have a clear division line um, between uh, countries that believe that trade agreements should not create requirements for tra technology transfer for companies, and countries like Brazil and other developing countries that believe that uh, technology transfer should be encouraged and not limited uh, in trade agreements. And of course, there are some points uh, related to regulatory frameworks that are also discussed. In these points, the WTO would not necessarily be the focal point of discussion, but the WTO wants to see more coordination with the participation of other international organizations and member states. These regulatory frameworks, they are uh, most la mostly three. One of them is consumer protection. There is a lot of agreement that consumer protection needs to be more harmonized, uh, including on the level of enforcement. Uh, privacy is another uh, topic that is very important. Of course, in discussions on the e-commerce and the Council of Europe Convention 108 is seen as one of the very important um, frameworks, international frameworks of treaties that member countries should adhere to in order to foster harmonization. Um, and uh, cybercrime, which is another topic. There are several researchers that point out the fact that the lock, lack of trust uh, is mostly due to problems related to uh, cybercrime and, and concerns related to identity uh, theft online and, and, and breaches to privacy. So these are some of the issues that are being discussed in the WTO, in the WTO like I mentioned. Uh, the ministerial will happen in November, and I think it would be of interest um, to this community as well to see how issues are going to take place in the ministerial. Thank you very much. That was a very uh, quick and concise uh, summary of some very complex issues. Uh, I'd like that now to turn to our four uh, panelists who come from different stakeholder perspectives, I think, um, governmental and private sector and technical community, civil society, to uh, offer their thoughts in five minutes a pop, please. Uh, about uh, both the procedural aspects of whether or not you think that the, the trade framework approach uh, needs any reform, et cetera, to make it more consistent with the kinds of things 
that we expect in the multi-stakeholder environment, uh, as well as the substantive issues and the positions taken by European uh, governments. So any of those points that any of you would like to get into, uh, it would be really great. And we'll start with you, Robert. Thank you very much for voice and invitation to the Tallinn. Uh, I'm Pani Pushari uh, of Minister of Digitalization in, in Poland, uh, responsible for uh, information society and uh, called uh, to work on, in, in treaties. Yes. Uh, in our country, Poland, uh, we have internet and society and, and digital economy uh, 23 uh, years. This is rather like in the other countries. And because of that, uh, we have uh, our um, uh, experience. And like a new ministry, very young, because our ministry exists uh, above one year, yes, and was uh, created from the Ministry of Administration, and because of that, it, now it's Ministry of Digitalization, we can create a policy thinking uh, on digital way. And in one moment, uh, we are quickly recognize that uh, we need to start to look on not only digital single market in Europe, but globally to think about digital economy through uh, and above the, uh, the borders. Because of that, uh, we try to check the WTO, uh, like, like you invited me to talk about it, yes and uh, the offers from, uh, from many countries. And in one moment, uh, we recognized that um, it is a very difficult way, but it's very um, important uh, to have an ambitious agenda for uh, Buenos Aires, like that, for example. But of course, we, we had uh, also Oslo, we, we had a uh, June uh, discussion. Um, in the meantime, uh, was, uh, 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 the Commission uh, um, carry a negotiation uh, with uh, Canada, of course, is TISA, TT, uh, in the, at that moment TTP, I, yeah, yeah, of course, now Turkey, yes, and uh, now it's, of course, the most important Japan. And uh, our country uh, uh, is uh, one of the 15 like-minded countries about uh, data flows. And we think in that uh, treaty aspects and data flows um, uh, like a data, personal data and unpersonal data. We think very, uh, very real about that data, uh, data came, came, in, uh, came in from machines. And maybe it, uh, it will be a little new, but uh, everyone here uh, know a famous mantra, data is uh, oil. It's in my opinion, in our ministry, it's uh, uh, a little true because if we think about digital economy, uh, it's, it's worth to, uh, to see that data is an air, it's a nature, it's an environment. And every machine who observes the data need to share the, the data to others to make a, in, uh, innovations. Because we uh, also observed that uh, old innovations blocked uh, new innovations because of closed technology, closed uh, algorithms, and uh, patterns, for example. And uh, it's, it's, it is very important to start this discussion how to open that legal instruments to uh, make a movement, to make an uh, environment, and make a trust between countries and ecosystems, different countries, even China, for example, uh, to, on, on uh, 2nd June was a submit uh, in, uh, in, 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 uh, excuse me, in the Commission. And if we think about different countries and we think about uh, like a cooperation between, between uh, ecosystems and multi-stakeholder network, yes, we can uh, build a new agenda, despite WTO will be not um, uh, fruitful, for example. Um, of course, in the same moment, we need to prepare the agenda, yes, we need, uh, that is a very good point, uh, a commerce level. A commerce level could create a trust, trust service, contract uh, acceptance, the signature, it's a very, it's a very normal and natural uh, analog word. It's not, it is not specific on the digital. The digitalization uh, gives give us the 
possibility to be present between transactions, yes. Maybe uh, like that. Um, um, our uh, aim is to work on this tr treaties very, very openly because we believe that data for, pe for Poland, for example, yes, it's an uh, error to make a growth and happiness of our um, citizens and, uh, and entrepreneurships. Thank you. Thank you very much. In precisely five minutes, that's astonishing. So thank you. I uh, appreciate that. Uh, let's turn next to Konstantinos Komatais uh, from the Internet Society. Konstantinos. Thanks, Bill. Uh, hi, everyone. So I think that one of the crucial questions we should ask ourselves is whether the Internet governance community, whether we are ready to have discussions for trade. Um, and I think that if we were to ask this question five years ago, perhaps, the answer most probably would be no. However, right now, the world is very different, and uh, we have all come to realize that also trade discussions are very different. Substantively, in particular, uh, issues that affect the internet, whether we're talking about intellectual property rights, or data protection, or data localization, for that matter, or security, are start popping up more and more. Uh, in trade agreements, which inevitably make those agreements an issue of uh, internet governance. However, procedurally, it is a completely different issue. Trade agreements have historically been closed, uh, some would say even secretive. Uh, the transparency was lacking, uh, there were accountability questions, and for a community, for this community, for the internet governance community that has fought so very hard, to ensure that stakeholders, the multi-stakeholder model, uh, is sustained and preserved, this is a very hard challenge. Um, and we have reached a stage as an internet community where we have stopped fighting, and we should stop fighting about the multi-stakeholder model. It has been recognized, it is in, in many, many documents from the OECD, from uh, the UN, from uh, WISIS. Uh, these places like this are celebrating this very inclusion. Uh, and we should not fight again for the model just because it, it happens in a different space that it's called trade. And this is simply because trade impacts the internet. Um, but it used to, I mean, the, and trade discussions always used to have a certain impact on the internet. Let's take taxation, for, for instance, that Marilia has spoken. We at the Internet Society are in the business, amongst many other things, of helping uh, various countries and communities setting up IXPs. Uh, those are the internet exchange points that ensure that the traffic runs locally. Thus, it creates much more efficiency, lowers the cost, etc., etc. One of the things that we see all the time is that because of trade barriers, and taxation in particular, the equipment that needs to get into the country gets stuck at customs. And it gets stuck for a long time, meaning that by the time that it is released, it is almost unusable. And that equipment is very expensive. Technical standards, again, this, it is very interesting and it's very good that these discussions are happening, but we also have to be very mindful of what we mean by technical standards and how those technical standards relate to the Internet. What I mean by that is that the work, it is very important that the work of organizations like the Internet Engineering Task Force or the W3C that are coming up with those very Internet standards is not undermined. Those standards have for the past 30 years supported the Internet and they operate under certain specific procedures that are not necessarily always understandable, I would say, by trade negotiators uh, or within the context of uh, trade. So, where are we now? Well, I think that things are a little bit more complex given the current political climate that uh, exists. We hear uh, increasingly that uh, from various sides uh, that globalization is challenged. Uh, some protectionism policies are even uh, emerging uh, and approaches. And this creates challenges to the global internet, which by definition is supporting uh, globalization. So I think that it's more important than ever, perhaps, to A, make sure that 
the internet discussions, we accept that the internet discussions are part of trade, and we become part of these discussions. We find a way, not necessarily to be at the negotiating table, but we find a way to demand the transparency. We find a way to demand that the text is released to everyone at an equal pace, not to certain groups. And we find a way to make our voice heard and influence those discussions. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you very much, Konstantinos. Um, so, okay. Uh, we turn next to Erica for another view. Erica. Thank you so much. Um, when Bill asked me about two weeks ago, or maybe a little bit longer, uh, what I think about the idea to have the multi stakeholder model infused into trade environments, and in particular digital trade and uh, data flow, I was a bit skeptical. Um, and it took me a while to evaluate my own history and knowledge about the trading and uh, the trade environment. I was a member of the European Parliament 50 years and covered trade, was a speaker on trade. So I negotiated on behalf of the trade committee in the parliament um, many, um, many existing uh, arrangements. It's a complex environment, but I think there is something interesting about this idea. And thinking about it more and more, I like it even more. And let me tell you why. So first reason, there is an in, um, immense pressure actually to do something in the digital trade environment, either in relation to e-commerce or um, uh, data flow is one of the, the more uh, latest kids on the block. Um, so there are many reasons why. And it becomes even more important because many member states and many states globally are searching for solutions. And these solutions you need to find independently if you want to have a total open uh, internet bo um, a trading environment or if you want to have some protection and uh, data localization. In both cases, you need to find a solution. But the second uh, side, I think it's important to think about it in a way that this uh, multi-stakeholder model is flexible, sufficient flexible, and can deal with quite complex environments. Um, so it is maybe a good way of testing it. And I would say not in the sense in becoming suddenly a partner in all trade issues. Um, this is too much. Um, but maybe focusing on few uh, areas which uh, relate to the internet, to the digital internet environment, in particular data flow. It's a young, it's very young. Uh, governments are searching for solutions. So it is an, uh, it is an easy way uh, to become a partner in this discussion. Secondly, I think it is, nothing is running away in the moment. Um, the World Trade Organization is not suddenly moving fast. It's not moving fast since years, uh, at least not on the, um, on the global level. So I, there is no, no hurry. Um, the, bi uh, the bilateral trade agreements are a little bit different. And there we have at least seen in the EU-Korea agreement already a text in introduced uh, with regard to financial services and um, uh, data flow. So there are some examples uh, which already exist. And of course, there are examples on working group level, like the e-commerce level on um, on data flow, they're all very soft, but in anyhow, they indicate that there's a need to understand this environment better. So I would recommend really to focus on this environment and maybe not even to go and try to capture all topics. Taxation, it's such a complex environment. I'm not sure if we would want to go into the, um, would want to start even working on a taxation environment. Um, but data flow, my recommendation would be definitely to pick this up and to test it. And I think governments would be more than willing uh, to listen to us. Oh, thank you very much. Since that's what I'm busy running around advocating, I'm very happy with that. <laughs> so, okay, uh, Wolfgang. Yeah, the beauty of the internet is that everybody can communicate with everybody. And we have heard from Gurant, we have now 4 billion users. So that means we have, if you multiply 4 billion with 4 billion, then you know the options we have for uh, uh, bilateral communications. The problem comes that also all internet-related public policy issues are also interconnected. And what I see is that uh, one of the weaknesses of the um, systems and mechanisms we have today is 
that while everything is connected with everything, issues are negotiated in silos. So uh, last week here in the same place here in the same hotel, there was a conference of the NATO uh, Coordination Center for Cybersecurity. And you know, this uh, military people discussing the same issue, but from a totally different perspective, and they come also to different conclusions, but certainly decisions made in the cybersecurity field affect the digital economy and they affect human rights. Uh, people in the digital economy, like the G20 ministers for the digital economy, they had their own meeting in Düsseldorf in April. This is a totally different crowd, they, including the trade people. Uh, as we have seen, they have for years and their meetings and their cultures and their traditions, but decisions they made have consequences for security and they affect also human rights. And I think here in, 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 in our more or less human rights-based environment, the internet governance people are very uh, close to engagement of, uh, um, uh, and support for human rights, privacy, freedom of expression, freedom of association. So we are also a little bit disconnected from these people who are discussing security and trade. And the way forward, what I see is really to pull them out of the silos and to create more and better uh, communication among them and this uh, goes, uh, you know, more deeper into the multi-stakeholder model. But the multi-stakeholder model is not one model and I can only echo what Konstantin and Erika has said. If we try to uh, be more elaborative on the multi-stakeholder model, we have to accept that the internet is also a layered system and on different layers you can have different practices. We had a senseless discussion for years whether the multilateralism dies because we have the multi-stakeholderism. Uh, this is nonsense. The multilateral treaty system will not disappear. But it's embedded now in a broader environment where all stakeholders have the same. Certainly the final negotiations where it comes to legally binding treaties has to be done by groups and uh, persons who have a legitimacy <laughs> to uh, negotiate this, and this will be governments. But it would be totally stupid if governments would not, before they enter the negotiation room, enter into a broad multi-stakeholder discussion to get the various arguments from the other groups on board. That means this would enhance their capability uh, to come to uh, negotiation results which are also sustainable. If they ignore the voices of the public, then the consequence is you have thousands or millions of people in the streets protesting against the outcome. And that is not in the interest of anyone. So it, it's in the self-interest of government that they keep their role to negotiate, probably also in a closed environment, but to open eyes and ears before they go to the negotiation room. Thank you very much, Wolfgang. So, okay, we, we have a, a good half hour uh, for open discussion with uh, everybody in the room who would like to get involved, as well as any remote participants. I want to recognize back here Arangel uh, Bojanovic from ISAC Serbia. He's our remote participation person. And if anybody uh, online has something that they want to interject, just flag me and uh, we'll call on you to make that happen as well. But in the meanwhile, of course, for the people in the room, uh, I think uh, this is a, a good opportunity uh, to try to synthesize by, by contemplating uh, some of the points that were made by the panelists I think are really important. We can't have a completely unrealistic understanding of how international trade is gonna work. The trade community is deeply institutionalized. It's extraordinarily complex. The processes they follow are not ones that most of us are familiar. I, I've been doing trade for 30 years, but, but mo most people don't really follow this stuff. And so when you, you do try to interject yourself, uh, unless you do it in a truly informed way, you're going to get a backlash from these people that it's not useful. At the same time, they are functioning in a void. You've got people sitting around, not just in the WTO, but in a lot of trade environments, trying to make decisions about very complex issues related to internet encryption and so on that they really don't even have the tool sets to work on directly. 
Uh, so there has to be a way where the global internet community, broadly defined, can, through some parallel kind of activity, provide an input, provide a, advice, discuss some of these issues in a way that will be useful to the trade community. So I hope that we can try and think about how to begin this evolution going forward, because these trade issues are not going away. It's, as I said at the outset, it's like security. Trade is going to be a big thing in the coming years. Uh, there's a huge push coming from all over the world, from a lot of governments and companies. And so we're going to have to engage this space. So I now see that I've got a couple of people uh, waiting in the line, so that's fantastic. So let's, uh, let's start uh, with the gentleman here. And uh, please just get in line behind the, the microphones. And when you speak, uh, say who you are. And please try to limit yourself to a reasonable you know, minute or two. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Auk Bals and I come from uh, the Netherlands. Um, and this year I was part of the pre-event of Jordic regarding copyright. Um, and my question to you as a panel is, um, how could copyright issues be solved um, with an um, WTO or some other agree um, agreement? Because like Wolfgang just said, the internet is now uh, it's, it's one network, but it's divided in silos, but also in the movie industry, the contracts are based on um, countries itself. But how can we make um, or open up these silos for, for instance, the movie industry? Thank you. Copyright has been one of the most divisive <laughs> issues from the standpoint of Internet people uh, when looking at trade agreements. Uh, who would like to take this up? Morelia? Uh, Madame, go ahead. I mean, it's maybe one of the most difficult issues. First of all, it's an old one. It's not new. So data flow is nice and beautiful because it's, it's a relatively young issue. Um, so the uh, intellectual property rights, it's a standing item in uh, World Trade Organization since the beginning. It's part of all of the agreements, the bilaterals, the um, and the multilateral. And there is always a conflict. You always have a conflict between, in particular, the recent years, between the more established um, industry, which needs more traditional IP protections, and the ones which have their models more based on what is either called in the American environment fair, fair use exemptions or in the um, European exemption and limitations, which practically allow uh, for individual use um, a more liberal use of, um, of work. Um, and this um, is not solved. And I think it will continue. I don't see a quick solution. It might shift over, over years since more internet models are becoming more business driven as well. Take, for example, the, um, the TV industry, um, uh, the movie industry with Netflix. So they are suddenly business, workable business models. At the time, it was difficult because there were no real workable uh, business models. So it might just fade away one day because they're workable business models and then suddenly um, the topic becomes less political. Um, but I think otherwise it will stay. I can't see it fading away or being solved. I'm not even sure if I would recommend it becomes part of our, it, it shall become part of our discussion, but maybe less in the sense that we believe we can offer solutions. Uh, but I'm just guessing a little bit what we could do in this environment. It's getting written into all the trade agreements, though. It is um, everywhere. Very quickly, I had a chance to follow discussions in the World Intellectual Property Organization for some years, and I think that one of the things that is based on the way that we conceive intellectual property is that there is a mindset that more protection is always better. And although the digital development questions this because we have so many different models of revenues that are not necessarily based on intellectual property and more protection. This has not percolated into international organizations um, at all. But one of the things that are important that I think that we should do is to expose the different positions that countries take. Because if you go to WIPO, for instance, you see that the delegations are perco percolated by lobbies from uh, publishing houses, of pharmaceutical industries, and many times uh, the same countries take a completely different position elsewhere, including in internet governance spaces. So if we 
build more bridges with the access to knowledge movement, for instance, we can expose these positions and to try to see, okay, what are you defending after all? So this thing is something that we need to do as a homework because there has not been enough discussion on access to knowledge, I think. Thank you. Only quick, if I can add something. Maybe we start the union, digital union, the, that multi-stakeholder uh, agreement from the data. It's, it's rather easier than from the uh, IP size. Because data is a not unique thing. It's a data. Yeah? After algorithms, it's a unique. And th that is a, a level of protection. But not before. And maybe we slowly can uh, develop the road to the interoperability for open standards and to, to, um, to able uh, talking of machines, yes, like that, for example. Thank you. We have somebody here who's actually spent years studying this problem. So yes, perhaps you could... Very briefly, I don't think we should really underestimate what this community has done in terms of the IPR. I mean, think of 15 years ago, even within trade, I mean, think of 15 years ago, it was a no-go, right? Right now, yes, there, are a lot of, there is a lot of IPR discussion within trade, and I totally agree with Erica, you know, this should not be the starting point. But we, and by we, I mean this, the internet community has really managed to open up a lot of these discussions, uh, has managed to express its concerns, its support, uh, its voice in this discussion, in these discussions, and it has managed to an extent to influence these discussions. Now, the IPR, as Marilia said, is taking place in way too many places. So, and because it's taking place in so many different places, it is also very important that we pick and choose. At some point, I predicted the same thing would happen as Erica. As, new, as more and more business models emerge, uh, they will become, and they are successful, they will actually become part of a completely different discussion than it currently is. Thank you. Uh, the gentleman over here, please. Could you, could you speak up, please, and say who you are? Okay, I think you have a mic problem. One second, please. Are we good? No? My name is Ian Fish. Uh, I'm from BCS, the Chartered Institute of IT in London. And uh, my question has partly been answered already when you were talking about APR, but uh, it's actually more general. And it starts from Wolfgang's uh, assertion about uh, the multi-stakeholder model. Um, and it sounded to me as if the multi-stakeholder model for internet governance doesn't necessarily include all the people that are really needed for internet governance. And this may have an impact on trade negotiations. I just wanted to uh, hear from the panel what they thought of that and whether it would. Wolfgang? Good. Begin these questions. Uh, again, you know, the, uh, if you look back 15 years ago, the multi-stakeholder model was not really um, a discussion point because it was just invented. And there was a lot of doubts, you know, whether this will work or not. Now, after 15 years, this model is seen as a helpful instrument to settle some questions, not all, all questions. And I always say we are in the early days, so we have not yet too many, uh, let's say, concrete outcomes from the process. What we have in ICANN is really a demonstrated uh, success uh, which uh, has created a so-called empowered community. But this empowered community has still to be stress-tested whether it works. So we have in the uh, Sao Paulo conference, we have a demonstrated success that the community can come together and to draft a text of principles. Uh, the Sao Paulo Declaration on F uh, Fundamental Principles for internet governance is probably the best document we have so far as a reference document for, uh, for internet governance. 
So, but uh, for other issues, it remains to be seen how this can be developed. I think Bertrand and Bill and others have argued since the uh, days of the World Summit on the Information Society that each issue needs a special solution. One size fits all doesn't work. So that means you have to build the solution around the issue. And there are some issues where you have different responsibilities and different roles for the stakeholders. So, and in, again, probably trade, cybersecurity for the military. These are issues where the governments have to have a place where they are sitting alone. But other issues, uh, you know, probably governments should be more in an advisory role as it's with domain names. So, and, but the general principle is, and I can only repeat what I said in my first intervention, is it is wise for all stakeholders before they enter into a decision-making phase to consult with the other stakeholders so that they understand the arguments better and take this on board if they uh, try to find the final consensus. I don't know whether this exactly uh, uh, answers the question. I, I think that um, he was particularly interested in the question of inclusivity. Um, would anybody else uh, want to get on that particular issue or, or shall I move on? Uh, just briefly? Huh? whether the pro we have the, all the right people engaged in multi-stakeholder process for this. I, I mean, what I like about this idea, I haven't thought about it much more than at the beginning, um, is that this is maybe an organized group, well-organized, tested uh, over many, many years, uh, produced like um, Wolfgang said already, outcome. Um, it is maybe the only global group in, um, in, the, in the internet environment who could become uh, influential and could actually do this. I, I would say if we uh, stay modest and not suddenly become, we can do everything. I don't think so we can do everything. We have to be modest and take it step by step. But on data flow, I, I think we can do it. And there is a, there's a vacuum, there's something needed because nothing organized exists, which is broad <laughs> enough like a multi-stakeholder um, environment like ours. All the others are not organized. It's either, you know, particular interest from certain NGOs or business. That's all good, but it's not uh, defined as a community. So there might be a role for us to play. Yeah. Just very briefly, in terms of inclusiveness, I think you, you have a, a point, and you raise a, a very valid point. Having said that, however, there is also an increasing now demand from people to participate. So we see more and more people from Africa because they're entering the internet space and they're getting connected and they say, I want to be part of this conversation. I, I, I demand to be part of this conversation. We see that discussions, up, you know, up until recently it was only English. Now discussions are taking place in other languages as well. Uh, we see bodies like the Internet Engineering Task Force, which only used to have meetings in the Western Hemisphere to actually, sorry, yes, to actually hold meetings in South America. So we see that, yes, inclusiveness will always be a, ch a challenge, but as more people are getting online and as the next four billion are getting online, I think that we will see much less of that issue. Thank you. Annette has been waiting patiently over here on the left, and I note that Luca has improved the feng shui by moving to the right, so we, we have balance, that's great. So, Annette, please. All right. Annette Mühlberg, I'm a member of the European uh, Internet User Organization of ICANN Eurelo, and I'm also a member of the trade union Verdi. Um, I have three questions. First is, how do you define personal data? Is it personal is it data that can be related to a person? Second question, how do you make sure that the multi-stakeholder model really um, works? That those who do not earn money with data flow have enough resources to write studies in respect to human rights, etc. Because this is the crucial point about the multi-stakeholder model. If you have a multi-stakeholder where you have uh, uh, 10 people, just uh, as an example, who have loads of money who can ask 1,000 people to write uh, nice studies and they have uh, a thousand users, 
but they have no money at all. So this is a problem. So um, does the EU Commission give that money? Just a question. And third question, how much time do we really have? Is it November this year? Okay, three <laughs> juicy questions. Who would like to start with the intermingling of personal and non-personal data and the definitional problems thereof? Would you, uh, Erica? I, I can take the first one. The, the way I would see it is the following, at least for the European Union. I mean, you have to do this um, country by country. It will be not identical. So for the European Union, we have a framework, a general framework on uh, regulation uh, on personal data. This is the basis. And um, this is not something which is going to be negotiable. But this is not what is going to happen in the, in the trade environment. But what is negotiated is to ensure that data can flow, uh, flow freely. Now, you, you buy something in another country, you want to ensure that what you buy, you receive. And if you buy it in, uh, from, um, from somebody in, um, in another country, which is not part of the European Union, you still want to receive it. There are different ways of ensuring this. When you take, for example, the uh, European Union and the United States, but similar agreement exists with other countries where personal data needs to be transferred, there are what is called, um, um, in the past, it, uh, the name was Safe Harbor Agreement, which ensures that the practice in different countries are accepted by the other countries. It's always tricky, it's never easy, but you have to do it, because otherwise you will have no e-commerce, no global e-commerce. Let's be clear, you will not have it. So we, the, the way I would see it, not to go into the discussion about um, personal data, but really to focus more how to ensure that e-commerce is ensured and what is an environment, uh, environment therefore, to ensure it is safe and uh, it is protected in case data is involved. And how to handle the safe and the protected. Um, countries have good experience already. It's never easy, um, I said before, but countries do have experience how to negotiate this. I don't know if just, somebody else wants. Do you, you have a follow-up question on this one? I just want to but amplify we can do something. bilaterally otherwise. I, don't, I want to amplify something about her question, though. You know, one of the challenges has been for the European Union and for others in trying to define approaches here is that personal data and non-personal data are increasingly so interwoven, so intermeshed in so many different types of transactions that, that if they're mixed. So that, you know, your, your data is all over the world in different servers all the time. And, you know, any kind of transaction that you may be engaged in or that entities may be engaged in, there may be bits of ide personally identifiable information linked in there. And so then the question becomes, can an approach that is, that is based on uh, the, the, the data subject should be able to know and give permission and so on, how do we make that work in that kind of environment? It's a difficult question. It is a very difficult question, but I mean, it's not like we are starting fresh. We are already having an e-commerce environment. It's not uh, like we are suddenly inventing the internet or we are inventing how to buy a product online. We are doing this um, and there are different ways of doing it. And, and um, industry has different answers to these complicated questions. If they, if they send you a product, um, typically it is already in, in, the, in the country where you are located. At least if it's um, um, the biggest, the bigger uh, retailers are doing this. So it's not like they're not close to your country or inside your country. It's different if it's a digital product. So there are different ways of uh, doing it. My, my only advice would be, um, we have examples. We have either, even examples in the complicated area of personal data, where the Europe, at least the European Union uh, negotiated uh, with different countries uh, agreements, how the both sides come to a standard agreement that both sides can ensure standards are high and data can be exchanged. And built on this, I think we can uh, build global models. Okay, uh, just briefly, and then we will move, because she had two other questions, and I have Lucas standing over there. Briefly, <laughs> because if we look at, look at for uh, samples, the samples is coming, the uh, United Kingdom with Brexit, because the uh, United Kingdom is after implementation of the law, European law, and after Brexit, this is a question that uh, if the, that law will exist or not, 
and what about adequacy de decision or what about the partnership agreement uh, who can um, prepare the rules yeah, of that, of personal data. Thank you. Okay, who would like to take uh, quickly the money question? Her second question? Well, that was the first one. Was the first one was privacy, second was money, and then the third, I've already time. So just very quickly on the issue of, uh, I think you're referring to the issue of capture, if I, if I understand this correctly, right? Uh, so I think that the, the answer to the issue of capture can only come from the stakeholders participating in the process. There will always be an issue of, culture, of capture, whether you are talking about the multi-stakeholder model or any other model. Uh, but the, the, so participation means raising up and identifying the, the capture that is happening. And I think that all of us uh, have seen it or have seen the potential of it happening in various spaces and it can be stopped. It's not easy and it doesn't come with the magic solution. But stakeholder, when we say the multi-stakeholder model, we just do not say just show up there and, you know, be and sit at the table. It means meaningful participation. And meaningful participation means actually with making those very hard um, choices of speaking up when you see this capture happening. And on time, there's every different negotiation setting is on a different time frame. So what happens in the WTO ministerial in December is one thing, but then TISA, NAFTA, uh, everybody, they're all working in different time frames. None of these issues is going to go away. And I mean, they're going to be, they're going to be increasingly dominant in the years ahead. So it never hurts to get started sooner than later. Um, Luca, you've been waiting very patiently. Yes. I'm sorry. Go Thank ahead. You. Luca Belle, I work for the Center for Technology and Society at FGV. I had a, a comment, or a comment and a question regarding uh, negotiation taking place within trade institutions such, such as the WTO. And my observation, my initial observation at the very beginning when I started reading about what negotiation were uh, actually considering is that many of the issues that have been debated have already been regulated at the national level. Uh, data protection and neutrality, interoperability, intellectual property rights. And so skeptics may think that the same issues being reproposed in venues that are very distant from democratic accountability may be a strategy to overrule what has already been decided through democratic uh, participation. Uh, and the second observation is that there are many governments that are very constructively uh, participating uh, and have been participating over the past uh, decade to multi-stakeholder venues, uh, promoting multi-stakeholderism, uh, transparency, inclusivity, openness, and so my question is, uh, in your experience, have you noticed any of those governments de facto promoting within trade negotiation more openness, uh, the, in, the, in, the inclusion of, cons for instance, open consultation, which is something that is, uh, ne has ne never been experimented uh, within trade negotiation. So those governments that within the multi-stakeholder multi uh, venues that we uh, use to, uh, to attend promote multi-stakeholder reason. Do they also promote it when they have to negotiate trade policy? I would love to answer this, but I don't want to preempt my panelists, so. Thank you for, uh, that was a question about sample. Uh, very good question, uh, if we can observe the environment uh, around the world, we have for ex very, very serious sample, China. And actual relation between European Union and China, European Union and G20, for example. And other side, the, the Trans-Pacific uh, Agreement, Japan, China also, New Zealand, Australia, yes, Indonesia, like that. We uh, previously uh, had the United States, now not. This is a very big question, yes? Because uh, United States uh, actually resigned to negotiate the TTP uh, Act, yeah? But this is that, for example. Uh, we have uh, countries, D5, 
around the world, yes, uh, the nine in the in the Europe, uh, Nor Nordic uh, digital, also, uh, Poland, we we are inside, yes, for example, <laughs> but we are we are a part of the European Union. This is a, this is a one uh, yes, a member of multi stakeholder agreement. Um, just a quick comment. I think it's a very good question why these issues keep popping up on the international level. I think that they, they are there for different reasons. Some of them, it's a requirement of harmonization of different approaches. So on privacy, for instance, as I mentioned in the beginning, there is a big promotion of more countries of the WTO to sign a Convention 108 so they have a common framework of discussion. So harmonization is a concern. There are other reasons that are related to, for instance, something that is still a moving target, such as encryption. So the contribution of the US is interesting, for instance, because they mentioned that encryption is important uh, to guarantee privacy. At the same time, encryption should be seen in the light of guaranteeing law enforcement the possibility to conduct their work. So the interpretation of encryption internationally is still a moving target, and I think that it has been advanced there to create another platform for discussion of encryption, for instance. So I think that different topics have different reasons, and there are issues that are more purely related to trade, such as a single uh, window or taxation that makes sense to be taken there. So different uh, agenda items have different logics to have been included in the agenda. But I think that one important um, topic is that Diplo Foundation promoted a course on digital commerce, aiming at opening a channel of discussions with negotiators that are going to be at the ministerial to discuss issues that have a digital background. If someone is going to sit on the table to discuss network neutrality, for instance, or encryption, it's important to understand the technical aspects of it, and also all the background and history of discussion that these topics have on digital policy and inter -governance, internet governance landscapes. And one of the things that we realized from the course is there is a very high level of openness to discuss these issues with other actors. There is a very high level of interest to understand how the the EATF or the Internet Society work on the development of standards, they do ask a lot of questions. And one opportunity to engage in the debate with them, and this is my last point, is the WTO Public Forum that is going to uh, happen soon. Uh, it is a moment in the WTO in which any stakeholder can make propositions of workshops. It is open for anyone to participate. The deadline to propose workshops to the WTO Public Forum is the 18th of June. So if you want to propose discussions, including on the issues that you raised, Luke, I think that is a good opportunity to do it. It is an open space of discussion. We've reached the witching hour, so I think we need to wrap this up. Uh, I, I just want to make one very quick response to that, uh, Luca. That is that both at the national level, there are consultations, and we need internet participants to get engaged there, particularly in the industrialized uh, world, um, but I think increasingly in other countries as well. And secondly, what it's about is trying to establish criteria by which those existing policies do not become used uh, as uh, hidden trade barriers and become more restrictive than is necessary to achieve the legitimate public interest. So that's the, that's the sort of approach that's being taken. Anyway, we've only scratched the surface here. It's a huge area. I've got two and a half minutes, but I've got all the organizers waving at me and saying stop. So, so I, I'm going to follow what the organizers are telling me. OK. Um, so I'm sorry. We can discuss offline afterwards, but I believe I'm supposed to stop. So thank you very much, all. It's a big, complex area, and obviously there's much more to be said about it. And we will do that later, but not right now. So thanks. thanks. Well done,